people having issues with supply chains. And Jim, I'm going to switch presenter over to you. Once the poll is done, you'll be able to share your screen. Thank you, sir. All right. Since we're hitting close to 1.30, I'll go ahead and close this poll and share the results. So are people having supply chain issues with the way things are going right now? It seems like things are split pretty evenly. The only one is nobody's got spares of stuff. <laughs> so nobody's in a, a great position, but people are at least getting through or struggling. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Jim, and there you go. I can see your PowerPoint window. Excellent. I'll go ahead and expand my screen as well. And I can see the slide presentation. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity to chat about supply chain challenges that folks may be experiencing today. And I guess before I get started, just so that folks in the audience know who who's speaking with them today, who's this Jim Fry guy and why is he here, right? <laughs> so my, my credentials for participation in this event today include 12 years as a project manager and estimator for a metal fabrication company in the Northeast, specifically titanium fabrication. Fabrication. I've spent 22 years as an ERP product expert in the Epicor vernacular, that is a solutions engineer, and 15 of those years were in fact with Epicor software. So uh, quite a bit of experience with the Epicor framework. I started with the Vantage product, Vantage 6, when I first joined Epicor, and I departed in 2015 currently with Source Day in the supply chain space. I have presented Epicor Solutions at 12 of the last 15 Epicor Insights events uh, in either Vegas or Nashville. In, coincidentally, I had collaborated with Robert Brown of Epicor Software a few years ago during the inception of some of the Epicor's advanced unit of measure design capabilities. And so we worked quite a bit together early in that process. So I was very excited to see the output of that here today. Thank you for that. And then I guess ultimately I have worked with more than a thousand manufacturing companies over the years and it has been my life's work. And so my path has shifted recently to a much more acutely focused area of supply chain management. And I think everyone on the call today can, can recognize based upon the poll results that we just saw, <laughs> everyone is struggling in that area today. And, and so for the last 24 months of so, or so, there has been unprecedented supply chain disruption. And the focus of my presentation today, and, and I'll really call this a discussion, is to chat about some of the challenges that people are faced with and potentially what types of solutions can you consider to combat those challenges to help your company improve from a, an operational perspective so that you're not getting the financial impact that's typically associated with, with that disruption. And so along those lines, one of the primary commonalities, I guess, across all manufacturing and distribution companies is that you work very, very hard to meet your customer demand. And so whether that is in the manufacturing world where we're producing product or in the distribution world, excuse me, where we're looking to fulfill customer demand on time and in full. I would argue that there's probably no one on this call that has an on-time delivery metric associated with supplier fulfillment that is equal to 100%. In my experience working with Epicor customers over the years, that number ranges anywhere from 60 to 90%. In, in very few circumstances, it may creep above that, but it is rare. <laughs> and so the challenge that most organizations are faced with today, and it really doesn't matter the size of your company, whether you're a a global or domestic organization, no customer, no company is impervious to supply chain disruptions. And if I just throw up a few logos here, you can see some of the news that we've seen in the last 18 to 24 months that some very large organizations were experiencing. And as I flash through here, you'll see some challenges associated with very recognizable organizations. And so one of the things that we want to make sure that we touch on here today, and, and it's really the elephant in the room, right? What is causing all of these supply chain challenges and, and what's the solution? How can we combat that and help our organizations grow profitably moving forward? And so 
the key takeaway to all of that is that when we talk about supply chain disruption, there really is no silver bullet that's going to fix everything. Anyone that professes to have that solution is probably not giving you 100% accurate information, right? There are a number of things at play here, and depending upon the industry that you're in, those challenges tend to move around a little bit. I know from personal experience, the semiconductor world today is just upside down. There's not enough supply to go around. And for those organizations that are in the military space, typically get first dibs on those. So the smaller the organization, the more challenging it is for them to find supply. And so the net effect of that, of course, is that if we're unable to correct some of those supply chain challenges, there are costs that our organizations are going to incur. And so I've shared with you some independent information here. This particular excerpt was taken from a quarterly release by Deloitte. They had conducted a survey amongst CFOs during the third quarter of this year, and more than 40% of those CFOs indicate that the supply chain shortages or delays have increased their company's cost cost by 5% or more. In my experience, that percentage, the 5% is experienced by very, very large organizations, right? And, and you can expect that if you're not one of those Fortune 500 companies, which very few folks on the phone are, right? Running Epicor software, you're running a mid-market application suite. So you're probably experiencing a higher cost impact associated with those late deliveries. And so, where is that coming from? Well, certainly there's going to be some supply chain challenges that are that are impacted by force majeure issues, right? We've had the COVID pandemic notwithstanding, uh, you know, the impact of some of the changes that are going on globally have impacted our economic supply to an extent that has really pushed the limits for many organizations. And so what we're looking to do as organizations today, as manufacturers, we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to satisfy our customer demands. And so in many cases, that means solving some of the first mile challenges in our operations to reduce the impact of some of those last mile challenges that many of us can't really impact, right? When we talk about all of the ships in the in the right-hand side of your screen there off the coast of Long Beach, California, those are ships that are just waiting to come into port, right? And the, the image on the left-hand side is a recent snapshot taken from the air this week, actually, off the coast of Singapore. So on both ends of that journey in this particular supply chain, there are significant challenges, delays, time on the water for raw material supply, et cetera. And so the comment I made earlier about the silver bullet, are we able to, is any company, any organization able to fix those two challenges in and of themselves, right? And, and, the, and the answer is no. There's very few things that you can do when those boats are sitting there offshore. We can provide visibility to what's there and we can identify the time at which they leave their port of origin. But while they're sitting out there, there's really not much we can do. But we can solve some of those first mile challenges prior to the shipment of goods that would certainly alleviate some of those challenges. More on that in just a moment. I'll kind of leave that dangling for just a second and, and share with you another independent expert testimonial here. This, this happens to be Laura Cesari, who I have tremendous respect and admiration for. She is a supply chain expert. For those of you that don't follow her blogs or perhaps are not connected with her on LinkedIn, I strongly suggest that anyone that is in the supply chain world or is impacted by supply chain challenges, and I dare say we all are, I would encourage you to connect with her and follow some of her advice and tutelage. She's been working her entire career in supply chain. She's worked for AMR. She's had impact in Gartner reports based upon her world-class research. And, and she shared that through numerous blogs, not the least of which is one that she continuously develops. She's the author of the Supply Chain Shaman. A lot of tactical execution type activities that uh, she shared over the years that I found to be very insightful. So uh, what she has to say is that you need to align your organization against solving the gaps in the supply chain. And one way to do that, of course, is to map the supply chain from your customer's customer to your supplier's supplier. supplier. 
And so that end-to-end -end communication is critical to solving the first mile challenges that could mitigate the effects of those last mile challenges of getting those product from the port to your building or to your customer. And so we need to be able to challenge the current state. The traditional supply chain approach that we've worked with and, and utilized for many years is fraught with challenges today based upon all of the things that we're experiencing. And so one of the primary challenges that are that is driving that that effect is the fact that our Epicor ERP system and our supplier network in many cases is disconnected. So what that means is we're not involving some critical stakeholders in our success in our day-to-day -day activities, or at least not to the extent that we can to minimize the impact of supply chain disruption. And so when we think about the fact that suppliers typically get their demand from our manufacturing organizations, the folks that are on the phone today via email, and, and many of you are using advanced print routing, which is a tremendous tool that enables you to automate those emails going out to those suppliers. And certainly that is a necessary step in automating manual processes, but it's not always sufficient, right? Because the procurement team who actually releases those purchase orders to the suppliers is required to follow up with those suppliers using some traditionally manual tools, things like email, phone communication, and dare I say, in many cases, spreadsheets that are supplied for the supplier to update and return. And so when you think about the fact that you have a world-class enterprise resource planning solution that provides end-to-end -end capabilities in terms of Epicor ERP, once those purchase orders are generated from Epicor ERP, recognizing MRP planning parameters, the submittal to the supplier is done via email and then everything else that's communicated back and forth is done through those manual tools that I made reference to a moment ago. When you add to that two primary challenges, one of which is that more than 50% of purchase orders are going to change over their life cycle based upon our experience with existing customers, you take that initial communication that's being done via email, and then you multiply that by the number of changes that occur to price, quantity, delivery, the acknowledgements that are typically required from a supplier to give you confidence and reliability in their supply and their ability to deliver products on time. That becomes a very unwielding initiative for the procurement team. So initially, as all of the folks on the phone here would recognize, when you're communicating with your supplier and they acknowledge a PO, either via phone or via email, you're required to go into Epicor, go into the purchase order header, and throw that box that says that that purchase order has been acknowledged. That's assuming, of course, you're not using some of the embedded Epicor supplier collaboration tools, which of course, are pretty strong, but my intent is to point out the fact that there are other options there. We need to make sure that ultimately, at the end of the day, the Epicor customers need to be satisfied with the tools that they're working with, and they're getting the solutions to their business challenges resolved. And so as we look at the purchase order changes over time and the tools that folks are, are using to, to manage that change, it's not inconceivable to imagine that there will be some discrepancies between the buyer's expectations and the supplier's realization of those expectations. And so because that's all being done manually, there's opportunity there that prevents real-time communication and accuracy. More on that in just a moment. I mentioned there's two things that we can do in the first mile to impact and reduce the impact of the last mile. The second one is that Without exception, everyone on the call today has a need for every part that they place orders against their suppliers uh, for their production needs, right? You need every part to be able to ship to your customers on time and in full. The challenge against that, of course, is that your on-time delivery performance from your suppliers is probably not 100%. In fact, on average, we estimate that to be about 66% on-time delivery performance across the existing customer base, which leaves you with a third of your parts not arriving on time. The challenge with that, of course, is that you never know which third of those parts it's going to be. And so what most organizations do to combat or alleviate that risk is they'll build up their safety stock to account for any anticipated shortages that they may have. 
Now that's a great way of protecting your customer's deliveries, but it's an expensive solution. You're throwing money at the problem by building up your, your inventory and tying up working capital. So there is a cost impact associated with that one third stock out scenario, right? Or, or 66% on time delivery performance. And so those two things, the manual way in which most manufacturers communicate and manage the buyer supplier relationship and the less than 100% on-time delivery performance from your suppliers both have an impact on your organization. And that, and that impact can be measured in terms of monetized cost to the individual organization. And so as we step forward, and, and my intent here, you'll probably get a giggle out of this, and most folks in the procurement and supply chain world see this all day, every day, right? Solving those first mile challenges certainly can reduce the impact associated, but they're so busy with their day-to-day -day tactical execution of purchase orders and follow-ups that there is, <laughs> there's really no time for anything else. So you can't fix the problem. And so for that reason, when we talk to the procurement team, the supply chain team about about better ways to do things, fixing the supply chain challenges and offering new, better ways to do things faster and with more accuracy, more velocity communication back and forth between buyers and suppliers. We tend to get some pushback from the procurement team because there's really no time to do that. And so what we as an organization, and I'm sure everyone on the phone will agree with this, you know, there are certain requirements and commitments that we have to make to our organization. And the fiduciary responsibilities associated with efficiencies and being able to produce product and deliver product on time, but also hit our targets in terms of revenue and cost is critically important. And so from an operations perspective, in my experience, it's typically the operation managers, directors, VPs of operations, the CFOs, directors of finance. Those are the folks that are typically looking out 18 months, 24 months, 36 months to, to solve these challenges and move the organization in the right direction and, and make sure that we're not spending more money than we need to on the day-to-day -day operations, right? And so why, why do I mention that? What's the point of that? Well, the point is that one of the comments that was made during the very introductory comments of our session today, right after 9 a.m. Central Time, Christine and Beth and Hesso and Graham had all talked about ROI, very, very high level, but what does it mean to the organization? Well, in my opinion, working with many manufacturing companies as I have over the years, there are always at least five, six, eight, 10 different projects going on in an organization at any given time. And they're all competing for your time, your resources, your, your working capital, et cetera. And so it's important to be able to monetize the expected benefits associated with any new initiative. And I think that's something that we can all agree on. Whatever that initiative is, there needs to be some payback to the organization to engage in that. And so along those lines, when we talk about supply chain challenges and potential corrections or, or solutions to those challenges, with respect to improving supplier on-time delivery specifically, there are some bottom line and top line business impact, positive business outcomes, if you will, to improving that supplier on-time delivery performance. And there's typically multiple pillars of impact. And you can see on this screen that the four that I've identified that really resonate to improve supply chain performance is the cost associated with increased on-time delivery, or the cost savings, I should say, recognizing that late deliveries cost our, our organization some volume of dollars, right? Reducing late deliveries is going to reduce the cost associated with late delivery. That makes sense. More on that in a moment. In terms of faster inventory, if we have better communication between our buyers and our suppliers, and that communication is done in real time, it improves the accuracy of that information and therefore the reliability that we have in our supplier base. And so our ability to improve the communication back and forth between buyers and suppliers will result in and foster better relationships, helping us to potentially reduce pricing and improve the inventory turn ratios and reduce inventory valuation, another monetized cost associated with doing business, right? If, you've, if you're carrying $10 million in inventory valuation today, there is some 
cost associated with carrying that inventory. And that cost varies quite a bit from company to company. In my experience on the distribution side, it could be down as low as 10%. And then on the manufacturing side, it could be 15, 18 or 20% or more in terms of inventory carrying costs. And so there are some opportunities to reduce that cost through improved supplier on time delivery. And then of course, the two at the bottom of the screen, customer order protection relates back to revenue. So if you're able to protect your orders and improve your on-time delivery from your suppliers, the linear path here would be, if I'm able to receive product on time, I can produce on time, I can ship on time, I can invoice on time, and ultimately recognize that revenue on time. We all have revenue targets that we need to hit monthly, quarterly, and annually, and failure to hit those targets will result in some concerns around the top of the organization, right? We need to make sure that we're hitting those targets. And then last but not least, personal productivity. This would be a, a soft cost savings associated with automation, right? And, and automating manual processes that don't add value to an organization is critically important and it's a necessary step, but I submit that it's not sufficient. We need to go further than that. Automating manual tasks is only part of the solution. We need to provide our team with better tools and better ways to do business in this new economy that we're faced with. We need to be able to not only improve those tasks, but also generate those results that are measurable so that we can continue to move those graphs up and to the right. And so personal productivity, if you, if you have a tool in place that it provides better visibility, better communication back and forth between your buyers and suppliers, improves the accuracy of the information that you're sharing back and forth, and reducing the time spent following up via email and phone communications and spreadsheets. If you're able to reduce the amount of time a typical buyer would spend performing those tasks by 15 to 25%, you're looking at a a soft cost savings that is not an insignificant amount of money for most organizations. And so there, the summary to that is that all four of these pillars could impact both the top and bottom line. Bottom line for increased on-time delivery, faster inventory turn ratios, and personal productivity in the form of soft cost savings, and then top line from a revenue protection perspective associated with customer orders. So. All, to put this into perspective and, and give you additional clarity, it's, it's kind of like watching dominoes fall, right? There's a trigger effect here that leads to that waste and potential lost revenue. When you consider the fact that a late purchase order from a supplier could have some cost impact on your organization, and the amount of that cost obviously varies from industry to industry, company to company, uh, but it ranges, in my experience, working with manufacturing companies, anywhere from $25 to, in, in the distribution world, to $150 to $300 in a make-to-order, engineer-to-order world, to more than $1,500 or more if it's critical parts that we need to be able to get a piece of equipment out the door. My personal experience, having worked in a fab shop for a number of years, I was a project manager for a terephthalic acid project plant uh, in Indonesia. The Indonesian government had contracted us to produce some pressure vessels and heat exchangers. And these titanium pressure vessels were three, four hundred thousand dollars each. And unfortunately, our project got held up for a handful of stainless steel flanges, and we had some significant penalties that we had to pay as a result of missing those early in the process. And so my takeaway here is that while the cost of a late PO can be debated from company to company, I think we can all agree that there is some cost associated with that. So being able to monetize and measure that cost is important if we're looking to improve the bottom line of our organization. When you take into account some of those things, some of those costs that you see in the list here, being able to reallocate resources and shuffle your production team to satisfy that demand, you may be expecting to work on a particular project based upon receipt of material, but if the material doesn't come in on time, we need to put that workforce into other cells or other areas of the shop to be able to produce those alternative projects, for example. And then as we continue to, to have those dominoes fall, if 33% of your parts are going to be late based upon the average that I referenced earlier, it's not inconceivable to think that there's some impact on your revenue as well. I mentioned the fact that if we can't produce, we can't invoice, and if we can't invoice, we can't recognize revenue. Now, I would submit that it's not a dollar for dollar relationship there, 
but there is or could be some impact to revenue. So when we talk about that return on investment, if we're looking to improve in that particular area, what is the expected return for that? Well, generally speaking, we're seeing at source day about two and a half to 5% is what we typically see on a return from a revenue risk perspective. And so if it's $100,000 of late parts, for example, then there could be 5% of that may impact your revenue or more in many cases, right? So there is some correlation there is the takeaway. And then again, if the 52% of those purchase orders are going to change as a result of a, an adjustment to price, quantity, or delivery, it's not inconceivable to think that the corresponding AP invoice is also going to be a, a bit of a challenge, right? If you're changing purchase orders and you don't have up-to-date information, your match rate on the AP side could be impacted. And ultimately, all of that leads to some trust erosion associated with your customers, your peers, your leadership team, et cetera. And so, that domino effect impacts multiple areas of financial performance on the, the P&L. And so it's important to at least acknowledge the fact that there is some cost associated with those late deliveries and recognition that improving supplier on-time delivery can reduce or mitigate some of those costs that you're currently incurring. So one way to do that, of course, is to connect your ERP platform with your supplier network. And I'm not going to to go into a sales pitch here, that's not the intent of this session today. I just want to point out the fact that there are solutions. Epicor can, has some solutions. SourceDay has solutions. There are other supplier portals out there that you may have heard of to help you connect your suppliers to your buyers. What is critically important to the success of any manufacturing company thinking about engaging in that type of of an initiative is that you need to have supplier adoption. You need to make sure that the suppliers with whom you work are committed to the end game, right? Are they, are they going to use the tools that we're providing to them? And so that's a critically important part. And so my only sales pitch for this presentation is that Source Day does provide a supplier adoption guarantee for north of 80% of your direct spend. And the reason we can offer that is because we have a full-time team of folks that are responsible for the onboarding, training, and support of your supplier base. So we could take your supplier list, compare that with our almost 11,000 suppliers, and see which ones are currently using the platform and simply turn them on. And then we also attract the balance of your suppliers north of 80% of that direct spend through that managed services program. And what's important to note there is that the suppliers need to buy in and there needs to be something in it for them. So regardless of the platform that you're talking about, there needs to be that adoption. And if the suppliers are experiencing some gain, and in many cases they will, just simply because they're using the same tools that your buyers are using today, right? And that is email, phone communication, and spreadsheets. So if we're able to save them time and reduce the cost associated with them doing business with you, again, it frees up some of that time to build those relationships between the buyers and suppliers and potentially negotiate better pricing as a result of reduced cost. An added benefit on the supplier side is that they can be working with multiple companies and consolidate that demand into a single multi-tenant SaaS platform type of environment. So there's no cost associated with the supplier is the key takeaway there. Other Epicor customers that have gone down that path and experienced significant benefit in terms of those positive business outcomes, Chatsworth product is a big customer of Epicor. They are a case study for Epicor and also for Source Day. And in this case, they were able to reduce their work in process inventory by 66%, which is a significant value. And to contrast that with the 90% reclamation of, of warehouse space is unprecedented in most organizations. And they were able to reduce their late deliveries from suppliers by 70% by using the platform. And so the tools that you're going to work with to improve supplier on-time delivery need to have both tactical day-to-day -day execution capabilities as well as executive visibility. So the lens through which you might view the, the monetized value, right? The, the PO exceptions that are coming from Epicor MRP. We want to be able to consolidate or aggregate those totals so, so that we could see what the monetized 
impact might be for moving product, moving demand in, moving demand out, and perhaps in many cases, cancellations, right? So those are those suggest that there are demand signals coming from MRP for which in the case of the move-ins, if we're not able to communicate that requirement to our supplier and get confirmation of acceptance, then we're putting almost $5 million at risk in terms of revenue, right? So that's the revenue protection element there. The move outs has an impact on cash flow. So our failure to communicate any relaxed demand with our suppliers suggests that we're now going to receive product for which the demand is perhaps multiple weeks or months out, and we're tying up our cash in the process. And then, of course, cancellations are pretty self-explanatory. That's a working capital number. So that suggests that demand has been eliminated. Maybe there was a cancellation to a sales order and failure to communicate that and get acceptance and acknowledgement from the supplier could result in working capital being tied up for some period of time. So from an executive perspective, we need to know what those monetized values are to be able to manage and measure the results. And the technical day-to-day activities can be performed through a centralized repository where buyers and suppliers are seeing the same information and can communicate back and forth on multiple purchase orders, lines, and releases in a single view. Being able to reduce the amount of time that a buyer spends calling for expedited requests, looking at open order reports and getting updates from suppliers via email or via via phone. Being able to have prescriptive workflow to automatically reach out and touch suppliers if they've not responded to a purchase order in three days, for example, and having the supplier respond with an acknowledgement or proposed changes to the demand signals that were provided through Epicor ERP. And so the ability for those suppliers to see that information in a consolidated fashion, so rather than get a single purchase order for every demand signal, you may want to consolidate that to reduce the nervousness that the the suppliers are feeling when they get 15, 20 emails a day on perhaps 10 different purchase orders and three different changes. So they'll be able to see the same information in that row and column format. So from a, a UI perspective, it's very clean, very easy to work with. And alternatively, they can look at that in the format of a task list. So in sequential chronological order, they'll be able to see those new POs, they'll be able to acknowledge or propose changes to quantity, price, delivery, add notes, et cetera, and provide bulk responses across multiple lines, multiple POs, multiple releases. And so based upon that, those changes go back to the buyer for acceptance And let's say a typical, you may have a supplier that has five open purchase orders with 10 PO lines per PO. That's 50 lines. If there are 40 lines that contain changes, what the purchasing person would do today is go into Epicor, search for the purchase order, go to the line, make the adjustment. That would automatically record it in most cases into the change logs. You know who made the change and why, and then move on to the next line. Using a platform like this, those multiple changes can be reviewed and approved. And then we would write directly back to the purchase order line and release through the automation and integration tools. And then one, I I wanted to share that another challenge that a lot of manufacturing companies are faced with is the notification of advanced shipping notification from suppliers, right? So when there is a shipment, performed, whether it's shipped domestically or overseas, there is some period of time, the lead time for delivery needs to be known. We need to know when we're going to receive those products. And that's all based upon the the time at which it ships. And so if we're talking about a product that's shipping from the Asia pack region, and it's going to be on the water for 14, 16 weeks, et cetera. We need to know when those products shipped, what was in the containers that shipped, what's the tracking details, et cetera. And so Uh, Using a platform like Source Day, we can provide that tracking information such that when the supplier ships product, you have, as a manufacturer, full visibility of the contents of those shipments, what products were in there, those labels are barcoded, so you have the ASN numbers and all of the details associated with that shipment. For domestic folks, folks that perhaps are are buying raw material and then perhaps shipping to a a value added outside processor for further you know painting or or sandblasting or whatever the the value add service might be the only way you would know as a procurement person today that that product shipped from one supplier to another 
is to either receive an email notification or a phone call from supplier one or check in with supplier two to see if it's been received. If you have a daisy chain type of supply chain where you're buying raw material and then shipping that to two or three value added outside processors, that gets pretty cumbersome. But utilizing advanced shipping notification makes that much more visible in terms of, of when product is shipped from one location to another. So we can provide additional details on the tracking of each of those from the supplier perspective, which ultimately leads to supplier performance, right? We need to be able to measure the performance of our suppliers and, and that can be done in aggregate so that we know as a procurement slash supply chain team, what is the consolidated acknowledgement rate across our existing supplier base? What is the responsiveness to our requests for acknowledgement of new POs or any changes that have occurred to a purchase order? And as I mentioned earlier, more than 50% of those POs will change over the life cycle of the PO. How responsive is our supplier to those changes? And then from a quality perspective, I won't even go down that path. Epicor, even the standard base quality inside of Epicor ERP is a pretty significant value to most companies. So we would suggest that you manage your quality metrics through Epicor. And then if you're interested in looking at individual supplier metrics, your team, and as importantly, your suppliers can view their individual scorecards. So you can see the direct spend that's associated, the number of purchase orders that have been generated, and individual performance ratings associated with acknowledgement, responsiveness, and on-time delivery. And that is communicated to your suppliers so that you're in alignment with their performance and vice versa. Key takeaway here in terms of on-time performance, there are some variables that may impact that, that you have control over from a setup standpoint, because every company may have a slight difference in terms of how they capture that, right? You've got your original due date, revised due date, promise date. There's multiple date fields that you're probably capturing today. And so there's a lot of flexibility associated with that. The other thing that can help you improve operational performance within your manufacturing facility through improved communication velocity with your suppliers, I mentioned the fact that if you have 52% of your purchase orders changing and you're using manual tools like email and phone and spreadsheets to update suppliers and buyers with the results, then your AP mismatch rates are going to be higher than your potential can be, right? So summary to that is that through AP automation, and I do recognize having worked with the Epicor product for 15 years as a, as a product expert, the Epicor content management suite plus the AP workflow tools provide very strong AP automation capabilities. My intent here is just to point out the fact that there are alternatives for consideration. Ultimately, what you want to try to do here is automate to the extent possible any of those AP vouchers so that we can have our AP team focusing on just the exceptions. So if you're doing a line level match from a purchase order line release perspective. We want to be able to read, validate, and match those invoice lines to a purchase order, reconcile the parts, the receipts, and the prices, and then resolve any mismatches, and then send those, those matches up to Epicor to a, to a control group or a batch in a vouchered status so that you can go ahead and, and process the posting and payment activities. And so Source Day does provide some tools in that area as well. Very similar in terms of the user interface that we looked at a moment ago on the procurement side. This would be the AP element to that. I don't want to belabor this point. I just want to simply point out the fact that from a performance standpoint, we have two full-time data scientists on board that are constantly looking at new ways to look at data, right? We want to be able to crunch the numbers to determine what's impacting our ability to do better and measure the results going forward. And so this is an example of customer that has experienced both the PO collaboration and AP automation benefits of source day. And the results are, are seen there at the bottom of the screen. 15% increase in on-time delivery, 94% invoice matched and processed in a touch-free type of environment. So the takeaway here is if you're improving the velocity and the accuracy of the PO through all of those changes, then you're going to start with a higher match rate to begin with, right? And then from an AP perspective, the, the purchase order receipt AP invoice matching process can be done automatically in a touchless type of environment. They've also experienced $35 million in revenue protection and cash flow optimization of $54 million. And then last but not least related to the AP, and then we'll move on. 
they have over on the right hand side of the screen in a three month period they were able to achieve those numbers we talked about a moment ago they are 97 percent paperless today better visibility has helped them to triple their ability to take early payment discounts which has again a bottom line benefit to the organization they were able to shrink their month end close rate from two weeks to two days and they've experienced some of the easiest audits they've experienced in 30 years all of that is predicated on the fact that we want to be able to benchmark your current performance in terms of supplier on time delivery and the cost impact associated with that so that we can help you set expectations for the return for two reasons right one as we talked about earlier every company has a handful at least of initiatives that they're either in process or planning for and so you need to know what the the corresponding value might be for other initiatives to help you drive improvement and that can all be measured through different dashboards and, and performance metrics. I mentioned the data scientists a few moments ago. These are a few examples of, of dashboard performance that's available through Source Day in this particular case. But ultimately, being able to change the traditional supply chain process to improve not only the ability to automate manual steps, that, that traditional supply chain environment that most organizations are working with today and, and provide a digital transformation of new tools to do things better, faster, and more accurately going forward. And so I'm going to pause here for just a moment and kind of show a couple of high-level dashboards. My intent here is just to point out the fact that there's a number of ways to look at that information. And I will stop the presentation sharing, open it up to general questions. My intent was to focus on supply chain challenges. I did share a solution for consideration there, but ultimately at the end of the day, I think we can all agree that if we're able to provide our manufacturing customers with options to, to fix or improve their operational efficiency, at the end of the day, that's what we're all about, right? We need to be able to, to, to change the way the, the supply chain direction is going. And so there are tools out there that can help you do that. So I will pause and it opens up to general questions that anyone might have. I mean, Jim, as that goes, if you can get more work put through with the same amount of people or cut down on the errors without increasing the number of people, it's a win. But I do disagree with one of your slides. You only had $340,000 in revenue for canned beer, but yet hamburger meat was so much higher. <laughs> I don't think that's a good barbecue. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's that's good, Calvin. That's cool that you picked up on that. <laughs> and, yeah. and you're absolutely right. One of the one of the things I want to just respond to, you mentioned that being able to reduce the manual steps and are not adding value to the process. Finding the right combination of people, processes, and technology is critically important today, right? And it's not, as I mentioned a couple of times, it's not about just simply automating a manual process. There are better processes out there. There are better tools to help you manage that. And, and when we talk about productivity gains, saving the procurement team time, on average at Source Day, we're experiencing a 15 to 25% reduction in time. So that equates to about eight to 10 hours per week per buyer because they don't have to follow up manually with email and phone communication to do their expediting, et cetera. So that, that's just one element of the savings. But as we've shown through this presentation, there are multiple pillars of impact that you can focus on. All right, are there any other questions? Give people a moment to type into the chat window if you've got a question for Jim about how to better manage your supply chain or anything. And then, Jim, I'm going to throw this out, Jim, like the AP invoice is being tied to the ASN that was sent or the receiver that they received into Epicor and then matched to the PO that's in Epicor. The, the latter. It's definitely matched to the receiver created inside of Epicor and compared with the purchase order. So the traditional three-way match, purchase order, receipt, AP invoice. The ASN just provides additional information to support that, that receipt. All right, we do have a question from Jake Conrad. Is there a way to see if any of our suppliers are already using Source Day? 
There sure is. I'm happy to take a closer look at that. What I would need is just simply the supplier name, the web URL address for that supplier or the primary email address, and we can strip that out. And, and typically when we engage in that, a third column would be of benefit as well. And that is how much, how much money do you spend with that supplier today? Because there may be, let's say you provide a hundred suppliers. If we're, if we have, let's say 10 of those suppliers currently using the platform, but they're not suppliers that, that have any real volume, your, your value that you derive from that is not going to be as high, right? So you probably want to know not only which suppliers are on the platform, but which of the, what, what's the corresponding value to you, right? In, in having those suppliers on board. Happy to take a look at that for anyone that's interested. And what, they just email that over to you? That's exactly right. If you could send me a spreadsheet with those three columns, the supplier name, primary email address or primary contact email address or the web URL for that supplier, one or the other. And then thirdly would be the volume per year that you spend with that company. I can let you know which of those in many cases, if, if you send me the primary contact email address, I can tell you whether that specific person is using source day. And if you send me alternatively, just the web URL for the supplier, I can tell you that the company is using source day. If so they send that I'm sorry, you go ahead. Them or? We, yes, exactly right. So if they're not currently working on the Source Day platform, our team will take responsibility for the onboarding, training, and support. And then one additional comment I'll make here is that if we see, we're, we're constantly looking at our supplier performance. So if we see that one or two suppliers are not as responsive as some of the others that you're working with, we'll proactively reach out to those suppliers and see if they need additional training or support to get them up and running and feeling more comfortable with the platform. And then if it's an overseas supplier, you'll talk with President Biden about getting that boat unloaded first at the harbor. And I'm going to have to say no to that one. <laughs> we'll help get those uh, those overseas suppliers on board. We do have multi-language capabilities. There's no restrictions there. But as far as those boats that are on the water, yeah, we, we don't have a lot of pull there. Any other questions for Jim? And Jim, you've got one more minute here. Thanks. Yeah. Good time management. <laughs> well, maybe I'll tell you my favorite dad joke then. Sure. Fred, what's the difference between Dubai and Abu Dhabi? I have no idea. The people in Dubai do not like the Flintstones, but the people in Abu Dhabi do. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, had to go there. <laughs> You've gone all Barney Rubble on us today. <laughs> all right, if there's no other questions, we'll take a short break and start up again at 2.30 for Stump the Chump. And I think, Calvin, you're going to control that one with, you've got the PowerPoint and everything. <laughs> Yes. So I shall make you the presenter for that. Thank you, Jim.